theory is nothing but intuition. It is true that there are parts of game theory which are very hard mathematical theorems, but a lot of very, very useful game theory is nothing but very good, fine, intuitive reasoning. That was about political power. That was my original interest in the subject. When do you hold a group morally responsible? If you say that if from within a group, if some people do something dreadful, the entire group is morally responsible, that causes me a problem, a uh, propensity to feel that we too readily give moral responsibility on too many people. And this is a very risky, philosophically, game theoretically difficult and important question because to spread the blame too generously on a group is wrong and that can do damage. If one black person commits a crime, if you hold all black people responsible for it, you are indulging in wanton racism. You don't want to do that. On the other hand, and my own inclination, I'll tell you my psychological inclination, is to blame as little as possible. If you exempt everyone from moral responsibility because it is a group that has done it, then you may encourage bad behavior. Actually, very pleased to tell you that this paper called The Samaritan's Curse was actually published just last week in the journal Economics and Philosophy. Uh, the paper is The Samaritan's Curse. Those who, who find an interest can take a look at that. Let me tell you what the paper does. I'm going to convert people from selfish standard economic agents to moral creatures and look at what happens to the moral outcome. There is player one who has to choose between these rows, A, B, and C. And there is player two who has to choose between these columns, A, B, and C. After they have both made a choice, if they, if Player one chooses A, player two chooses C, the outcome is this box. Likewise, if player one chooses C, player two chooses B, the outcome is this box. And inside these boxes, I've written down the payoffs. That is the income that will be earned by each person. The left hand figure number is what player one earns, the right hand number is what player two earns. So if player one chooses A, and player two chooses C, player one gets $108, player two gets $108. A Nash equilibrium in a context like this is a very natural equilibrium idea. It is a choice of action on the part of, I'm seeing in front of me, Onirban chooses an action, Chitresh chooses an action. If after making this choice, each one of them feels, given the other person's choice, I have no reason to change mine. And Chitresh feels given Onirban's choice, I have no reason to change mine. Then this pair of choices is an equilibrium. No one will move out of that. Very easy to see. In this game, there is only one equilibrium. Take a look at this, stare at this. If both of them are choosing C, is this an equilibrium? The answer immediately is if they, both of them are choosing C, check what this person can do, player one. If player one switches from C to A, the outcome goes there. Player one earns $108 instead of $106. So C, C is not an equilibrium because player one will defect. In fact, player two will defect as well. So C, C cannot be sustained. There's only one box which can be sustained. I don't, don't know if you can see that immediately. Let me, since I happen to have a little bit of color, BB is the equi Nash equilibrium. And in fact, in a game like this, this is the only sensible equilibrium. This society is going to stabilize at BB. Both of them will choose B, they will get $104 each. Now the Samaritan's uh, curse game asks the following question. You can, for a moment, switch off from the board. Let me explain to you. This is the way we write down games. This is the way much of economics works. Individuals look at their own payoffs, they take their own decisions. But occasionally we do say that, look, don't be so selfish. Think of the action, what effect your action has on other people. Today, in the context of environmental problems, we keep pointing out that, look, think a little bit. You do something which for you is fine. You inject smoke into the air. But when everyone does that, it makes society worse off. 
and our future generations will suffer. So learn to change your behavior depending on the effect it has on other people. So the way I tell the story in the paper is a good Samaritan comes to town and tells these two rich people that look, you are playing this game fine to maximize your own welfare. Both of you are rich. You typically earn around $100, which is a huge amount of money. But do you ever think for a moment that the actions you are choosing very often can have an effect on poor people, bystanders? These players say, no, we never think of that. We do it for ourselves. But the good Samaritan comes and tells them that, look, you must learn to pay attention to um, the fallout on the bystander. And with that, what uh, the um, Samaritan does is the Samaritan uh, draws attention to the effect that their behavior has on a third person. I will deliberately assume that there is only one bystander. Um, uh, you can make it a hundred, a million, it does not matter. But one person who's very poor, who has no discretion of his or her own, this poor person's welfare depends on what these two rich people do. Let me see, I've got it right, yes. So this is what the poor person gets as a fallout, which means when these two people play the game, standard way people play games, what the poor person ends up with is $6. So this good Samaritan, the good moral person who comes, and I, I, this is the kind of moral that I would share, comes in and tells these people that, look, this person is abysmally poor. To have a welfare income level less than $20 is grinding poverty. You people are so rich. If you were willing to sacrifice $2 instead of $104, you get $102 each. This person would jump up from $6 to $20, from abysmal poverty to moderate poverty. Surely you should take into account their welfare. And the Good Samaritan goes away. And let's say, that people are persuaded, they become moral creatures. They and the morality of the or the kind of morality that I'm bringing in is the following: that these people decide that the two players A and B from now on, yes, I am concerned about my own welfare, and I don't care about what another rich person does, but I am concerned also about the poor person's well-being. So what happens now? After these people get this moral lecture and the Samaritan goes away, this game converts to a new game as follows. Whenever inside a box, both players get the same number, here I will write just one number since both of them are getting that. So let me do it now. So when the players become moral, remember now what the payoffs will look like. If both of them choose A, Player one gets a utility not of $102 because player one now adds on the utility of the poor person. So treats this as both of them view this outcome as $120. My $102 and the poor person's $20. That's the satisfaction I get. I'm a moral creature. Can you see this is not an equilibrium because at least one of them can do better by deviating. If player one deviates from B to C, instead of 110, player one will get 112. So this is no longer a Nash equilibrium. Where will this society settle down at? Which means the new Nash equilibrium, after the players become moral, they begin to value the poor person's well-being. The poor person becomes worse off. Moral creatures, take the group to an even more immoral outcome. The original outcome was immoral enough. Instead of 20, this person was getting six, and now the outcome is even more immoral. That is the Samaritan's curse game. So um, the, this uh, underlying story is, I think, important because it illustrates the sort of what the prisoner's dilemma does for individual rationality, that every individual trying to do well for himself or herself ends up doing worse for all of them is possible. We know this from the prisoner's dilemma, it's standard. 
what this game shows is that actually even in the moral domain we have that problem every person being moral can end up by making the group behave even more immorally you don't want to pardon of course the worst leaders but i mean when i look at uh, the international domain occasionally i think because to me the north korea is like a fictitious land uh, it is a strange country where the actions are dreadful uh, that is coming out from the top i mean they oppress their own people but the people of north korea have been brainwashed to the point that they think that all the information coming from all over the world is uh, made up information that north korea is a country which is doing very well but we know that it's a tragic country what they are doing is dreadful to their own people but it is possible that kim jong un is terrified that if he does something else someone else will do something dreadful to him and that other person is scared so collectively the leadership behaves drastically but individually there's nothing that anyone can do is a possibility like in this case you can say who is the immoral person paying no attention to the poor person actually neither of them both of them are moral creatures and by virtue of being moral they are behaving worse than they would have done otherwise that is the samaritan's curse what do you do about it in game theory there is something called uh, the game of life the game of life i think it was ken binmore who was my teacher in uh, at lsc he was those days a pure math teacher ken binmore i think coined it the game of life the game of life is a game where once you've described the game of life there is nothing more to life that is all there is now it can be argued that if this is the game of life the samaritan curse game is the game of life that there's nothing more for individuals to do they have to choose between a b and c and then they get their payoffs then the question of talking and persuading the other person is not there that's not a part of the game of life and we can legitimately ask if those options were there then we should write down the game as a more complex game you can choose a b and c you can get up and give a speech you can persuade the other person the leader all these kinds of storytelling that i'm doing the game and the, the big literature on this the leader's role never comes up i've recently been doing some work on the role of the leader and what does it mean to be a leader leads me to a question what role does the leader play and i take the view in this paper that i'm writing now that in the end the leader does not have to be powerful enough physically muscular enough the leader has to create cues and signals which get ordinary people to change their beliefs about one another and that then traps the system into this dreadful regime the leader's role is the role of the creator of focal points that's it i will leave it with that but let me explain the notion of the focal point for you very briefly how will i do it okay let me do it with this at the question that uh, i raise in the book on uh, the new way of doing law and economics is the following that think of the power of the law when a new law comes in it changes our behavior like well it often changes our behavior there are also places where it does not but there are change places where the law changes our behavior and i'm asking the question why does it change our behavior so suppose that there is a law that says that you can drive faster than say 100 kilometers per hour when you go from chandigarh to delhi there is speed limit law now let me actually let me begin with no speed limit law so every time you go from chandigarh to delhi no speed limit law you make your own calculations what is the safe speed to drive at and you want to reach on time weigh the pros and cons and you decide you're going to drive at 110 kilometers per hour in the free parts of delhi chandigarh uh, road now let us suppose a new law comes in which says that uh, no one is allowed to drive faster than 100 kilometers per hour the stand the, that affects in many countries that will affect people's behavior people will begin to drive slower than 100 kilometers per hour why so if you use the standard law and economics argument the economics the argument that goes back to the work of gary becker in the 1960s the line that you will take is you change your behavior because your payoffs change when you drive at 110 kilometers per hour 
before the law, you were thinking of the risk of there being a skid of injury. Uh, you would save time by going fast, but you would lose. There was a risk that there'd be an accident, etc. You took a decision. But now with the law, your payoff has changed. Why? Because now you're aware that if you drive faster than 100, and 100 kilometers per hour, you may be stopped by a policeman and fined. So over and above the previous calculations, there's a new calculation that you may have to pay a fine that changes your payoff function. Why does law change behavior? My view now is law changes behavior. This sounds mystical, but I don't think it's mystical at all. It's something very concrete, something that can be given shape. The law changes behavior because the law changes my expectation of another person's behavior, another person's expectation of my behavior. The law does not change the game. It changes our beliefs about one another. This is not a payoff matrix. I'm calling this game the squares game. Uh, I have this uh, game in my book. The squares game is as follows. Uh, a whole lot of people have to play this game. A whole bunch of people. Imagine all my audience, all of you people are playing this game. Each of you will have to choose one square, any square you can choose. If you choose the same square, I will give you a thousand rupees. If everybody chooses the same square, I will give you a thousand rupees. Otherwise, if you choose different squares, you will get zero. That is the game. So you're playing this game. The, the, let us say there are 100 of you, 100 players. And the game, again, the rule is you have to choose a square and just tell me, whisper into my ear. If all of you choose the same square, you will get 1,000 rupees. If you choose different squares, you will get nothing. Play this game, and I've done it in my class. It will be all over the place. You will, some will choose this, hoping others, everyone will choose this. Some will choose this, hoping everyone else will choose this. It goes. There are some clusters, but it's all over. Now, I'm going to put some ink on paper. I'm not going to change the game. I just literally rub in a little bit of ink on paper. I can write some words. I need not write some words. I have put in a little bit of ink on that square. And you asked me that, so what does that do to the game? I said nothing. Yes, of course, you can all, all of you can see this, that one square has ink on it, but the game is exactly the same. Choose any square, ignore the ink if you want. In fact, ignore the ink for the rules of the game. Choose any square. If you choose the same, you will all get a thousand rupees. If you choose a different square, if everyone doesn't choose the same square, you will get zero. Play this game. And I can, if you think hard and the group plays the game, I can assure you what the outcome will be. Virtually everyone will choose the square. This little bit of ink on paper does not change the game, but it changes the play of the game. Why? Because my expectation of your behavior, your expectation of my behavior, everyone expects everyone else to choose the square. My belief is in the end, the law does nothing but create a focal point like this. I once again feel you have to be very careful. We cannot jump and immediately hold the leader morally responsible because sign languages and hints are sign languages and hints. And who knows, I may be wrong that the leader may not have wanted what people read as sign language from the leader. So you have to allow for that, even with the worst forms of leadership, keep your mind open to the possibility that the leader may be a victim of a context and a situation. But this is a problem which I think is game theoretically interesting. As moral philosophy, it's interesting. And in the end, in life, we have to take decisions. And lawyers all the time take decisions. Was Trump responsible for the rioting on the Capitol or not? I do believe he's responsible. But the details of that, the Vandenberg versus Ohio case, you redo that. And there are new conclusions you reach. And my paper goes into these kinds of details in the end, actually talking about the January 6th event. But I've gone on for much longer than I had planned to. Let me stop. Thank you. Thank you.